In order to derive Heisenberg uncertainty relationships from the operators themselves, we will first return to the topic of commutation. Previously, we showed that order can be important and use that to define postulate number four. Now, let's examine what it means when two operators do not commute. When two operators do not commute, it means that if you reverse the order that they are applied, you will not get the same result. The notation used at the bottom of the slide where a hat and b hat are enclosed in square brackets means test if reversed in the order gives the same result. If they do, then we say that a hat and b hat commute. And if not, we say that they do not commute. So now that we have this concrete definition as to whether or not something or two operators commute or not, let us now test to see if the position operator and the momentum operator, if they commute. And if they don't, then we're going to discuss the significance of that value which is obtained. And the one thing that I'm going to point out right now is this, this note that I have written down here where sigma a squared times sigma b squared is greater than negative 1 over 4 times the integral over all space of psi star times the commutation relation times psi dx all squared. If it ends up that x hat and p hat do not commute, then we'll be able to discuss then the significance of that in relation to the uncertainties with which we can make those measurements. First, let's evaluate if x hat and p hat commute. And so to do that, we would first, or we set up these two test cases, or these two cases where we basically verify whether the order with which we apply these two operators is significant. And so on my left here, I have x hat, then p hat. And on the right, I have p hat, then x hat. And I'm going to apply these two operators to a trial function, this f of x. And again, this is so that we can keep track of derivatives when they appear inside these operators. And so if I explicitly substitute in for the momentum and the position operator, on this left-hand side, I have x times negative i h bar d by dx. And that has, so that's all to the left of f of x, this trial function. On the right here I have minus i h bar d by dx, x times f of x. Again, subbing in directly for the, the operators p hat and x hat. So let's start by just evaluating the left-hand side here, this x hat times p hat. So here I'm going to have negative i h bar x, and then I just am taking the derivative of f of x. So that just leaves me with df by dx. Over here on the right, we have a slightly more complicated um, setup. I still have my negative i h bar, but now this derivative is being applied to both the x and the f of x. So I have to take the product rule. So first times the derivative of the second, x times df by dx, plus the second times the derivative of the first. The derivative of x is just 1, so I'm just left with f of x. And so if I distribute my negative i h bar, then I'm going to get negative i h bar x df by dx minus i h bar f of x. And so now I can take these two and subtract them from each other to find out if I end up with 0. So this is now, I can write square bracket x minus, or comma, p hat, and that's equal to x hat p hat minus p hat x hat. And if I substitute in those directly, well, I know x hat p hat, that's negative i h bar x df by dx. And from that, I'm going to subtract off p hat x hat. And that is minus i h bar x df by dx minus i h bar f of x. Well, here I've got my minus sign distributes in and cancels out all the minus signs in the brackets. And so what I have now is I have here a term that's minus i h bar x df by dx plus i h bar x df by dx. So those two terms cancel out. And what I'm left with is i h bar f of x. And so now it's at this point when I can't simplify this any further, then what I can do is I can just remove the trial function, this f of x. 
because again, it was only there just as a placeholder so we can keep track of things like these derivative terms, which I'm highlighting here in the previous step. And so we would then say that the commutation relationship between x hat and p hat is equal to i h bar. So what does this mean? This means that since we did not get 0, then we have to conclude that x hat and p hat do not commute. And so what that means for us is that we are now going to be able to apply this note that I was talking about before. Because if we ended up with a 0, if x hat and p hat did commute, then that means this square bracket a hat comma b hat, well that just would have been 0. That is where I would take whatever value that I get here, and I'm going to just take that and stick that into that piece right there into that note. And so if they did commute, then I would be just sticking in 0, and that would mean that if I multiplied the variance of x hat times the variance of b hat, I would just get 0. But in this case, I have that it's equal to actually i h bar. So that means then that we can actually calculate a result out of this expression. This expression, as a side note, we will derive it in class. For the time being, we will just employ it here to demonstrate something fundamental about using operators and the uncertainty principle. So first, let's substitute in for our specific case here. We've got uh, sigma x times sigma p. And that's greater than or equal to negative 1 quarter times the integral over all space, psi star. And again, I'm writing in explicitly the commutation relationship here between x hat and p hat, psi dx. And all of this is squared. Well, I'm still writing the negative 1 over 4, and I've still got my integral between minus infinity and infinity, and it's still psi star, but now I can substitute in directly for the commutation relationship between x hat and p hat, which we just found was i times h bar. And I still have psi, dx, and it's still all squared. This i h bar, though, these two things are constants. So I can pull them outside of the integral, and I can pull them outside of the square. And so when I pull them outside of the integral, it's still i h bar. But when I pull it outside of this square, and the square that I'm referring to is right here, then that means I'm going to end up with i squared, h bar squared. I still have a negative in front, all divided by 4. This is, again, still the integral of over all space, psi star psi dx. And that's again, that integral is squared. So let's start canceling out a couple of terms. I know that i squared, that's just equal to negative 1. And negative 1 times the negative out front means that I just get positive 1. So that term just goes away. I also have inside my, my square function here, I have the integral over all space of psi star psi times dx. Well, this is for any wave function this psi star psi dx is the probability of finding the particle between x and x plus dx. And if I integrate over all space, then it is certain that I'm going to find that particle somewhere. So that integral simplifies to just being equal to 1. And 1 squared is still equal to 1. That means then that I can simplify this expression to h bar squared over 4. And again, that's still going to be less than or equal to sigma x squared sigma momentum squared. If I take the square root of both sides of this, then what I end up with is sigma x times sigma p, so the uncertainty in measuring the position times the uncertainty in measuring the momentum. That's just greater than or equal to h bar over 2. And this, of course, should be a very familiar thing, this type of relationship, because again, this is the Heisenberg uncertainty relationship. The thing that's truly remarkable about this, though, is that we started with this generic expression, this variance of the two, um, of the position and, and the momentum, and that had to be greater than or equal to negative one quarter times the square of the integral over all space of psi star, the commutation relation between x hat and p hat times psi dx. And by doing that, by finding out that we have operators that do not commute, 
then we get to find out what is the uh, Heisenberg uncertainty relationship between those two measurable quantities. And so the power of this is that if we had any two generic operators, we can determine their Heisenberg uncertainty relationship just by using this expression. And really all it means is that we just have to just know the operator that corresponds to the classical observable. And from that we can determine a Heisenberg uncertainty principle. In this preparation lecture, we have defined four postulates of quantum mechanics that we will use throughout the course. These can be summarized as quantum mechanical operators are linear and are eigenfunction eigenvalue problems with psi. The example I have on this slide uses the Hamiltonian, which incidentally defines the Schrodinger equation. Finally, to determine the expectation value of an observable, we would take the integral over all space of psi star times the operator times psi times dx. This lecture also introduced the concept of operators and demonstrated their important role in quantum mechanics. One major result from this discussion of operators led us to being able to generally write the uncertainty principle relationships for any pair of operators. If two operators do not commute, then they cannot both be known precisely simultaneously, and the magnitude of the product of their uncertainties is determined by negative one quarter times the square of the integral of psi star times the commutation relationship times psi times dx.